Okay, this morning we're going to talk with John Potoff, who has lived in Nipigon a number of years and came here to work for the Bell Telephone. So John's going to give us a little bit of insight into the Bell system that there was in those days uh, leading up till today when there are not too many landlines left. You're right. on, John. All right. Uh, I guess you want a little bit of my history. Um, I was born in Holland and um, came to Canada. My father and uh, my family, we immigrated to Canada in 1953. Uh, we lived in Toronto. I lived in Toronto until um, about 1965. And uh, in 65, we moved north, or myself and uh, my wife moved north and two kids. Um, what happened there is that uh, before we moved north, I had finished high school and uh, in Toronto, and uh, then I started working for a Dominion store as a grocery clerk, and I didn't really like that kind of work, so I went to night school. And I went to night school at Radio College in Toronto for about four years. Uh, then I had uh, my, uh, not license, but I had uh, my degree from that school, and they were interviewing people for work in the electronics industry. And I tried, or basically found out that I could work for a telephone company up in New Liskert. And I decided that's a good start, so why don't I go move to New Liskert? Uh, once I got to New Liskert, I, had, I got trained into the telephone industry because there are no schools that teach you telephone work. There's no uh, degree, no, uh, uh, how can I say that, uh, courses you can take. Uh, telephone industry is, a, is a basically a, a, an art or craft all by itself. You may need electronics, which I'd had, which is very help, helpful, but like in Bell, where I ended up, they would teach you everything right from the beginning. And they had what they call Bell System Practices. And uh, these were very, very good. And they would teach you everything you had to know for the particular job in Bell, where I ended up, uh, that you needed. Now, when I started at Northern Telephone, I was basically uh, introduced to Northwestern Quebec because that's where they had just bought out a uh, company Herakana uh, and Gatineau, a telephone company, and uh, that uh, was based in Val d'Or. The big contract they had was uh, they provided the radio system for the Quebec Provincial Police, which was basically the, the first time they had radios in their cars. This was in 1965. So my wife and I moved to Val d'Or, Quebec, lived there for four years, and then we moved to Rouen Naranda, which was about 60 miles west of there, and we lived there for one year. And later on, we moved to uh, to uh, northwestern Ontario to uh, to um, Thunder Bay. <clears throat> now in Quebec, I was introduced to basically all the radio systems they had, and, and I worked in microwave transmission, and um, also was in many, many police cars where they had the radios in the trunks and I would fix them whenever they broke down, which was occasionally quite a bit because they had very rough roads in, uh, and the, the, the radios just couldn't handle the, the shocks that were, they went through. So after working there for five years, like I said, uh, I, had, I, I had a friend who started with uh, Northern, not Northern, with Bell Canada in uh, he went to Dryden, I believe, and um, then he phoned me from there. He says, uh, Bell Canada is looking for people that are in, that are experienced. So I uh, phoned uh, the, the people in Thunder Bay, and uh, they, f they flew me for an interview to Thunder Bay from Val d'Or. So that was an overnight interview. And uh, I flew back the next day, and uh, before I even got home, they had already decided that they would take me. So I started in, in Thunder Bay, and uh, I was introduced basically to switching systems. So I had uh, 
never worked in switching. Uh, I only worked in the electronic and long distance circuits and uh, the, the multiplex circuits that combine many conversations onto one or two wires and send them for hundreds of miles. Or they send them on microwave systems and they were radioed from one place to another. So when I was introduced to switching systems, I did not really like it at first. And I basically worked and learned what I needed to know over a period of several years. And um, after one year uh, living in Thunder Bay, uh, there was an opening in Nipigon. And uh, my wife and I decided that maybe it would be nice to live in a small town because we didn't know anyone in Thunder Bay and there uh, might have been a better chance to learn, you know, get acquainted with more people in a small town. So that's where we ended up in 1971. I had lived in Thunder Bay since 1970, then I moved to Thunder Bay in 71, and uh, uh, to, Thund to Nipigon in 71. Excuse me if I'm a little nervous, but I'm not used to this stuff. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just go on as I, as I can remember it. And uh, when I moved to, Thunder Bay, to uh, Nipigon, uh, uh, I was the only one that worked in my type of, of uh, equipment, which is basically the switching system, which, uh, which is used to direct calls from your phone to wherever you want to call to. At the same time, they really loved having me around because I was also inter uh, basically uh, very familiar with radio systems. And, uh, and microwave systems and multiplex systems. And multiplex systems is where you combine, like I say, all the many, many different people together onto one cable or to one line or one radio signal and send them to the other, where at the other end, they're all split apart again and go to their various uh, phones that they wanted to talk to. So, like I said, I didn't really like switching. Uh, it was very, very basic. It was DC. But over time, I uh, got interested in it because it was le electromechanical. And uh, if I really had started out in a school where they taught that, I would have been very happy with that because it was very interesting. I was a big, became a, a, a troubleshooter. Uh, I w worked not just in Nipigon, but I had a truck. And with that truck, I traveled everywhere. And I must have put over a million miles on during the last 25 to 30 years that I worked with them. And I went from Nipigon to Scriber, Terrace Bay, Marathon, Horn Payne, Geraldton, you name it. I went all the way. And I worked both in uh, switching centers, which were all, well, there was different, two or three different types of them. And also I worked in, um, in microwave and multiplex systems. Uh, during the time uh, I was in Nipigon, um, we uh, got rid of, I shouldn't say got rid, but um, we had operators that used to, use the, used to uh, basically handle all the long distance calls. And there was a, set, uh, there was a group of them in Geraldton and there were operators in Marathon at the time. So if you wanted a long distance call, you just dial zero and then they would put you through. That all changed later on and I'll get into that later. But the thing is that during the time that I worked with, with Bell and also Northern Telephone, we, I must have eliminated about a hundred jobs with people that, had, that handled telephone calls. Just for a minute though, John, yep. tell, where was the, the, the Bell building? That's the one at the end of the street, right? At uh, Nipigon? Yeah. Oh, it's uh, right across from uh, the garage from, uh, it's on First Street. Oh, the one up on First Street across from Allen. Yeah. Allen. Um, Gerlach. Gerlach's garage, right, because that's where you did switching, right? Yes, that's right. I remember it. taking the guides there and you had all those switches. In oh, there. that was one of them. Yeah, and basically I, I remember taking Boy Scouts to, uh, to Red Rock because Red Rock was a different exchange. It was more visible as to what happened when you dialed the number and you see the switches going up and so on. Okay. They, uh, I don't know how much you want me to tell you about that now, but the fact is that 
the different types of switching uh, required training in every one. Uh, I worked on about five different types of switching, and um, at the end, before I retired, all that switching disappeared. This is all electromechanical, and uh, there was an English system uh, made by, by Etelco Company from England. We had one in Pass Lake, and then we had one in McDermott, and uh, we also had a switching system in Cameron Falls, and when Cameron Falls closed down, the township, they, I, I moved all the switches to Nakina. In Nakina at that time, they had a, an operator, a single board operator who handled all long distance from there, and as well as local calls. So she had a switchboard and I don't know how many lines she had, but Nakina was a small place and uh, she would handle all these calls during the day and the night. They had, no, I shouldn't say that she did it all by herself. There was different operators that worked different shifts. One at a time. One at a time. And uh, it was a very small place and uh, it became a, a, a dial t exchange. Mm -hmm. I would have would think about 19, Oh, 74, 75, you know, when we moved the exchange. And uh, back to, actually, they, they moved the entire building. And <laughs> it was quite a job. But the switching, of course, had to be all dismantled and then brought up there. So it was, it was a good job there. I can remember you speaking, though, about your driving and all kinds of weather in the oh, yes. season. I can remember yeah. you talking about that. Yeah. Some it, of those remote places where they were depending on you Yes, to show right. up and, and uh, correct things. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that uh, since I was the only one that did t t my type of job here, there were other people here who installed telephones and uh, worked on cable, like Harry Barton, he worked on cable. And uh, then there was also the people that worked for uh, Bill Kaufman. Bill Kaufman was a foreman who uh, looked after all the microwave systems, and we had four people that did that job. And that was in the bell, the building, the white building that's now the hydro building. Exactly. Imagine that was actually, that still, when I'm thinking about that was actually the bell building yeah. in those days. And I think maybe bell built that. No, uh, they did was not it? build it. Uh, it was uh, rented. Oh, it was Some rented. company owned it. Oh. And I think it's still the same. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. But uh, we, we, we were responsible for make, keeping it in, you know, uh, in good condition and so on. And that was to our own benefit. We had right. we used to have eight trucks in there, oh, I, I and it was quite a a jam jam up situation when every everybody parked in there. You know, we all had our own spots, and sometimes we get little ticked when somebody else from uh, somewhere else came in and parked their truck in the middle of the aisle, and then we couldn't get in. We'd have to move. Yeah, we moved a lot of trucks. So technology evolved that that place didn't wasn't needed anymore. Uh, that's right. Uh, that's true. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, Bell had a, the building on First Street, which housed the exchange, and that exchange basically uh, did, was sitting on a quite a large piece of land. And uh, just to give you an example of what, what Nipigon was like, um, when that building was put in there, and I think it was 1964, uh, that, according to the records in here, because I wasn't here at the time, but in 1964 that building was put in and it became an automatic dial exchange. What happened is the Bell, when they came here, they had taken over from another company. And this company worked out of Long Lac. Mm -hmm. And Long Lac had taken over Beardmore Telephone Company. And the reason why, if you don't know, uh, there are I have a book here basically that tells you some of the history of the independent telephone companies in, in, in Ontario alone. There's over 500 companies, telephone companies. Some of them existed with no more than about 10 telephones. Uh, it, it was really fun because, uh, odd, because what happened is that some, say, say you had a, 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 a store somewhere in a small village and they would get their supplies from a city that was close by, well, they'd either have to go there and order it themselves or write them a letter that they wanted so many sacks of this and that and so on. 
So some of these people decided that since the telephone industry was just starting up, they'd run their own line. And uh, they would run a line from their store to a supplier of whatever uh, in the city. And then they'd just pick up the phone and call them. And it would be a single line with two phones, uh, one phone at each end, and that would be it. Well, people got interested in this, so they'd like to have the telephone too if they wanted to buy, buy something, you know. And what happened, they, that's where party lines came in. They would have 10, 10 subscriber party lines all sitting on the same line, and they would, um, they would basically uh, try to get it larger, and, and then they have all these people on the line. They assigned you a certain ring that was part of the party. Exactly, line yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had five rings on one side and five rings on the other. And it was very, well, it could be very confusing because if you picked up your, your phone in the house, then basically you would, uh, you would be talking to somebody right off the bat. Or you use the whole line and nobody else could use it, right? Exactly. Right. And, it, and if you were on the line, then you would sometimes hear people pick up and say, oh, it's busy. And then they'd hang up if they were nice people. If they weren't, they would basically listen to some conversations. And, uh, and I, I don't know whether I should say this, but the thing is that when I was on a course in Northern Telephone, there was a lot of old exchanges and switchboards in all these small little towns that in Northwestern Quebec, also in Northwestern Ontario, because it's still that, uh, that uh, in those days there was basically uh, a lot of small exchanges still, and uh, the, the people that had that owned these exchanges didn't necessarily have the money to expand them, and that's how. But larger companies would take them over, and Bell wasn't the only one that took over small telephone exchanges. It was just it was a, a, a jackpot basically because Bell would handle a long distance for all these small exchanges, but the thing is that. Uh, Eventually, all these people went under because they couldn't afford to upgrade. People wanted more modern telephones instead of a phone on the wall where you listen to the, oh, one long, too short, oh, that's not for me, that type of ring, you see. They wanted their own phone and they wanted privacy. People don't like to talk on phones where anybody can listen. So if you were talking to uh, uh, someone that was on another party line, which also had 10 customers on it, you could have 20 people listening on your phone. So, <laughs> so it could, could be quite a mess, but it was very, uh, very handy to have these. And uh, this is why there's so many small companies started up. And it was just because there was a need for them. Although there were some people that said, well, I've been here for 90 years. I don't need a phone. I'm, I, I've been, I'm all right, you know. But these are the people that are my age that are, don't want to get into it let's say digital electronics anymore you know so anyway uh yeah uh, my job in bell was basically um to maintain all the switching centers that were around and so that people could call it, it was a 24 hour a day job i didn't work 24 hours but i could get called out at any time middle of the night middle of a snowstorm it didn't make any difference there was no way that I could refuse to go. In, in uh, northwestern Ontario, there was, like I said before, about ten diff uh, four different types of exchanges, which all required training. And we would get sent down to Toronto and, uh, and be trained for maybe, well, one course was nine weeks long. And uh, just to get on the exchange that I worked here in Nipigon. So no one was interested in live, working in Nipigon because Nipigon's exchange was uh, a type that only had one controller, a controlled, it, this controlled every single call. Whether you picked up the phone, the controller would give you dial tone. After you had dialed the number, it would test the number you had dialed to so that the, made, made, that the line was okay, that everything was fine, that it wasn't busy, that there were no faults on the line. All this was done by one controller. And uh, then it would connect you. And it, also the same controller would come into play when you made long distance calls. And, and long distance calls basically changed a lot. So what do you mean by controller? 
a yeah. person or a machine? Oh, a machine. It a was machine. all electromechanical, okay. Okay. and it, it operated. When I left, it operated over 100,000 times a day. <gasps> and this involved maybe three, 400 relays, which are electromechanical devices, and um, then it would put the call through. Be, being the, the fact that there was only one controller, if it failed, you had nothing. The, the office quit. It just didn't do anything. You couldn't get dial tone, you couldn't dial anywhere, you had no nothing. So in Geraldton and Marathon, the controllers, they had two controllers in in the in the office so that when if one failed for some reason and it wouldn't take much just the contact got dirty it wouldn't pass the information through and then the, the the call would fail the controller would then try it again try it again for about four or five times and in the meantime in if in, in between the times that it was trying if somebody else would pick up the phone they wouldn't get anything either so it was quite a, a nerve-wracking uh, business if you worked there and if you got called. Now, it didn't fail completely many, many times, but it had, there were occasions when this happened and then you would go in there and nothing would work and you'd, the sweat would just pour out because now nothing would work. No hospital phones, no OPP, nothing. And uh, it was very stressful. It was so stressful that my boss, who was aware of this, of course, <clears throat> uh, learned of another exchange like myself. My, the, the, this exchange was called an N52 crossbar switch. And uh, he found out that one was being re uh, removed from a place down in southern Ontario. So he got in touch with those people that in Bell, of course, that we would like to have that controller here. And it took about four months for a person to basically connect that second controller so now we had two they're actually called markers and this marker would alternate with the other marker and then and they would be able to call you could busy out the one mark if you had a marker that was basically not working properly you could busy it out and make test calls on it and without interfering with regular telephone calls and during the time that uh, I worked there we went from electromechanical switching to eventual digital switching. The digital switching required another type of knowledge, and you were, there were courses for that. Uh, these switches would require very little maintenance. As a matter of fact, they consisted of large electronic cards with all kinds of equipment on it, uh, you know, uh, resistors, transistors, all that stuff, uh, and you would just plug them in. Mm -hmm. So if something didn't work, then you'd pull out this card, which of course you had to analyze because you analyzed this digital switch by means of a computer. So we got interested in computers, mm -hmm. not that I was totally interested in because I liked the electromechanical by, by this time, but the switch, uh, they were fast, they were totally silent, there was no noise. If you walked into the office after we had changed this office, uh, I think it was in 19... I retired in 95, and uh, the switch was in in 93 or 92, and it was boring, but it worked well. And all the switches basically uh, were connected together, like it didn't matter where the switch was, they all connected for long distance definitely. Um, they connected to Thunder Bay where there was a very large, what they call a DMS switch, and it was all solid state as well and uh, digital and it do the job really well you know then there were standalone switches that would uh, it would work without aid of uh, of a controller in thunder bay so it was all basically connected and we changed i changed all the exchanges here from electromechanical to digital mm -hmm. it was a big job and then we became they were all connected by what they call fiber optic lines and that was another story. Uh, Bell basically modernized and modernized and modernized. And uh, it became very easy to maintain these switches. As a matter of fact, you could send anybody in to a, a switching center on a digital switch, and then you would be able to direct him from Thunder Bay to take the, this card out and go to the cabinet and take another card and stick it in. 
and uh, they would be all pre-optioned as to the exact thing, and they would plug it in. And if that didn't work, they would say, okay, it wasn't this card, take this card out, stick the original back in, and so on. So, you know, the, the thing is that uh, my job became basically very simple, so simple that uh, during, in 95, uh, I retired. I retired because Bell sort of terminated 15,000 technicians in a three-year period because they weren't needed anymore. So 15,000 of us got retired, phased out. Possibly some of them might get other jobs, but not too many because it's just we weren't needed anymore. So, John, when you're talking to go for, into digital, did the phone itself have to change? Like, I, I remember how phones changed, but I didn't remember the process of, no. of, of them changing. The phone would stay the same. Yeah, the phone stayed the same. Uh, the only thing that changed was the office uh, switching center, okay. and it could handle any type of phone. During these phones, uh, the progress of phones, like we used to have straight dial phones, and then they became touchstone phones. And then during that time, they also started up with uh, handheld phones that you could walk around with the house in. And they were, uh, they were fun in a way where you could go down the street and you had one of these handheld phones and you could pick up calls from somebody else and make calls on somebody else's lines. I and remember the, you phoning me one time and telling me that you could hear us talking. Oh, yes. Yeah, it was yeah. not very uh, safe. No, <laughs> no. Uh, mind you, they, they, they developed into very fancy phones and, uh, right. and, and became very good, you know. Uh, the thing so is... It's interesting, though, because uh, when you're talking about that, that, that the change is that schools and hospitals and some homes still have those old phones that only had to plug in and they don't need any hydro. That's so right. when the hydro goes out, they're depending on those old phones. Plus, there's a cell phone today, but yeah. those old phones are still very handy. Oh, yeah. I have three of them in my house. Right. And uh, I, I cut off the ringers because I don't want all of them plus my regular phones to ring at the same time. But they, uh, they work very well. They have very good audio qualities. If I talk to somebody uh, for a long time, instead of having a little handheld, which I do have, uh, in my hand, I'd, ra I'd rather have one of these phones because they have good audio quality, and they make a very good weapon too. The handsets are so heavy you could probably brain someone with it, you know. And uh, it's 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 interesting. But as far as long distance, you might remember that during the time, uh, long distance. First of all, you dial a zero, and you got the operator, and then she handled the call. Later on, you got direct distance dialing and you were able to dial, but when you dialed the numbers, say a 905 area code or a 416 area code, before the call was completed, the lady would come on, the operator would come on, your number please, do you remember that? Yeah. And then you oh, give yes. your number, yes. because then they could charge you for, for that call. Later on, that disappeared. We have automatic number identification. We put that in. And then there was different types of, of, uh, of that type of equipment. Some was made by Northern Tele Telecom or Northern Electric, as you might know it. And some of it was made by Stromberg Carlson. They made very good units. And it was all solid state, it was automatic. But you had, to, you had to make very sure that when you connected up a new line to somebody, that it would, you connected up the line with the wires in the office, you know, to the equipment. But there was a special circuit that you had to put in a direct line that you made sure that the number that you called from was registered in this equipment as your number so that you wouldn't be able to make a call and charge it to someone else. So that was one of the things that was basically uh, very interesting too and complicated. So is the um, building on First Street still in operation? Oh yes, but you wouldn't recognize it. Inside, I uh, I had a, fr a friend of mine that works there, and I, he called me in. Well, I think I he saw me at the uh, at the coffee shop one day. This is a couple of years ago, and I said, "Oh, I said, I wonder what it's like in there now." He says, "Nothing like you. The only thing that is different is still, still the same is the frame. The frame is where you connected everything together." And uh, I walked in there, and it was totally quiet, 
and there was a lot of stuff humming and little lights flashing and it was amazing. A lot of telephone work now is data. There's a, mo a lot of data being handled by the telephone company and, then when, and the most important circuits are banks and credit card companies and all that. They have to send data back and forth. It's a, it's a complete difference. Like, there's no more uh, hands-on work in there. You just type it in and the numbers connected. As a matter of fact, numbers are connected and disconnected for non-payment or people moving right from Thunder Bay in Nipigon. You just go out, you type it in, then you're done. Right. You're connected or you're disconnected, you know? Even when you have a problem, you can't guarantee where you're talking to the person from. No. When you phone Bell, it could be anywhere in Canada pretty well. Well, yeah. That is handling your call. Yeah, until I left all the, all the um, analyzing of whatever trouble you had with your phone was done from Thunder Bay right. rather than here. You know, you couldn't just, it was all done by a computer. How many employees does Nipigon still have working for Bell? Any? Uh, yeah, there's a few, but I'm not really sure how oh. many, maybe four, maybe three. Okay. And they just, uh, they don't just work in Nipigon, they're all over the place, just like I was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. there used to be uh, eight of us, plus a, plus a foreman, but right. yeah. Right. So it was a, quite interesting. Yeah, well, in 71, when I came here, uh, what happened is basically, uh, like I started with Bell and I uh, didn't know anyone, but we did go to church. And uh, Father Kennedy, uh, he uh, saw me as a new person and he says, oh, he says, uh, what do you do for, uh, for, for a hobby? And I says, well, I like to fix TVs and so on. He says, oh, he says, uh, well, you know what? He says, we need somebody on the recreation committee. So uh, right off the bat, uh, I got involved with the Recreation Committee, and then during the uh, next uh, little while, um, I also ha got in involved with uh, Boy Scouts. Uh, my son, who was about seven, seven or so, seven or eight years old, he wanted to belong to the Cub Scouts. So I got uh, talking with Jerry Rhodes and Bill Locker, and I became a scout leader. I had never been involved in scouts at all ever but you sure learn a lot and we handled about 40 boys for the varied on the year and so on and uh, we went camping and uh, we had a eventually we had a camp at uh, Pine Portage which was an old Abbot Tibby camp and uh, it was donated to us and uh, we looked after it and uh, camped there every summer one well one weekend First, first weekend in July, uh, and it was interesting. Like I learned a lot about what boys like and what they do, and uh, it was it's a good, a good organization. But the thing is that we found out, uh, Bill and Jerry and myself, that uh, people that send their boys to Cub Scouts don't really want to be involved in it, especially camping. We needed help up there. We couldn't go up there with 30 boys and just have two cars uh, or something. So the, the people would drop off the boys, we'd pile them in the cars, we'd go up there, and uh, we'd go through all kinds of activities. I became a cook. Uh, it's the first time I ever cooked in my life, and, uh, and for 40, 40 people or so, you know, depending on, on what year it was. And uh, it was uh, hard to get other people out to help. Uh, even at that time, nobody was interested in volunteering. I think it's worse today, but it was not that great at that time. Meanwhile, I was basically as well uh, in, in, uh, involved in, um, in the Recreation Committee, and I uh, be eventually became the chairman of the board, and um, I remember Glenna that we built a dock at Lofquist Lake, and I, I still have a picture lifting this thing up and all this right. stuff. That was a floating raft that we put out there that time. Yeah, a floating raft. We had all raft. the neighborhood kids come yeah. out to Lockwood Lake and help us move that thing into place. And I remember Herman built it, and Herman was worried going down the highway that it was going to be too wide. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for the highway, and the OPP might stop us. Yeah. But you're right, I forgot about that one. Yeah. And, and weren't you involved with the tennis? tennis uh, yeah, well, that's right. Uh, not too much. Uh, I, uh, I the had, building of it? There was the uh, the kinsmen, basically. They built the, uh, the or helped build the tennis court. And then when it got paved, and I forget who it was. Oh, uh, 
Ozzy Kankin and myself, we were the ones that painted the lines on that tennis court. And then uh, during the, in, in the winter time, uh, we would clean off the snow and, uh, and then they would use it for other, whatever they wanted to do on, on that ten tennis court. Yeah, so anyway, as far as the Recreation Commission was concerned, uh, later on, one of the ideas was, was actually my idea, why do we have uh, a Recreation Commission and as well as a arena board? Why don't we combine the two? And there was quite a bit of opposition to that, uh, but it wasn't, it, we, we did it. Uh, you know, we, we combined the two because it was just a facility, right? right? And uh, same with the, uh, the um, uh, swimming pool, when that came into existence, partly due to Father Kennedy, who right. did a lot of uh, groundwork on that and investigation and so on. We, be we became, as well, uh, running, we had to run the, uh, the swimming pool. We hired lifeguards and so on, and it was quite interesting to do that. Yeah. I was the secretary, I think, when that. Yeah amalgamated like that and yes yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, Big changes. then beside that I was also interested in fixing TVs and radios I did that for seven years about the same time I was in Cub Scouts for about seven years and then my son says well he says I, I like to play minor in minor hockey well the first thing I know I'm involved in the minor hockey and I ended up uh, being the uh, the chairman of, of that committee not that I knew a lot about hockey, but I, well, it was fine, you know. We did what we did, and there was a committee there, so it wasn't really that hard to do. But I attended a lot of hockey games, and I was then my um, my son got out of that. In the meantime, what was else I was involved in? Oh, you yeah. were involved in the shortwave radio or two-way radios. Oh, yes. I can remember you with all those towers. Yeah, yeah. And I you were involved in that. Yeah, I still am in a way, but not as much now. I mean, it's more computer stuff right. now. But in those days, um, I can remember you Yeah, talking. I had an amateur radio station. Yes, right. And I talked all over the world with that. And uh, then uh, sooner or later, I was involved, let us see, I became a counselor in Nipigon. And, uh, Who was the Reeve when you were when you were the counselor? Uh, oh, Jerry Brennan. Okay. Yeah, I, I worked with him for for two terms, and uh, and a term in those days was was uh, two years. Two years. No, no, sorry, three years. Three years. It changed from two years to three years, mm -hmm. and that was very advantageous for anyone that was on council because they could actually do something in the town and. Well, I won't get into details there, but the fact is that uh, it was better. It was better. So can you remember any special thing, John, that happened while you were on council for the for the town? No, I I, I really, I'd have to look. Like I keep minutes of everything. I keep minutes of the town council. I still have them. Oh, I was on the library board and uh, recreation. I was on there for almost 20 years. And at the same time, I was on the town on the town council, and then I'm on the library board. I'm this is the third time I'm on the, I'm on the library board. I took a ten-year break to be on the hospital board, which I just completed last year, and uh, I've been involved in many many things. So tell a little bit about the idea of the of the new library. Why? Well, the library uh, building was used to be actually a, a okay. restaurant in in the beginning. It was a I forget what I never knew because I wasn't here. But it was a restaurant at one time, and then Bell Canada bought the building because the restaurant either disappeared or went out of business. I don't know, and they uh, they had all the operators upstairs and they handled all the local calls. Now that was before my time. Uh, but I, I'm told there was at least 10 operators in there. And, uh, and then on, in the basement, it was a damp basement, uh, they, uh, all the equipment uh, that was used for uh, the lines, uh, the, the telephones and so on, there was a couple of people there, that, uh, one that I know, remember very well, Ken Chapman. Yeah. He was uh, one of the installers and he installed, he lived at the back of the building. Right. And then uh, the, the Later on, the library became a larger library. Uh, I think it was uh, situated in Saunders store at the yes, time. Yes, but that, the renovations there was a centennial project. Yes. Yes. That's right. We got the money uh, from the government, basically, yeah. and we enlarged the library after we had it. 
and we got rid of the apartment that was in the back and enlarged the library. But the library became too small, and it was uh, very crowded in there. And um, it was busy though in those oh, yes. days, John. Very yes. busy. But the first computers came when you had that old library. Yeah, that's right. That's yes, right. And we had them right that. across from the desk. Yeah. And there was, I think. Four or five of them, yeah. I'm still not sure. Yeah. And then they had a play area in the front with small children. And, the, and there was a little meeting room at the back, very small meeting room. Yes, that's where we had library board meetings. Right. Like I said, it was on, I was on a close to 20, 20 years by the time that... Who was the librarian? Well, D Mrs. Jubinville was the first librarian. Was Mrs. I, Donaldson there when you were there? No. Okay. No, that was before my time. Okay. And uh, I was on the board for that long. I became the chairman. I ran... Uh, information, uh, basically teaching sessions and so on. And as well as that, I hired and fired, well, not fired necessarily, but the librarians left, and then we'd hire other ones. And uh, there was always about six or seven people on the library board, and they changed from time to time. But uh, I stayed there a long time. And in the basement was the Sea Cadet firing range, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. I remember and, going down there. Yeah, and see, we also stored a lot of stuff down there. But uh, the only thing I ever got out of the library, except satisfaction that I was there, is that uh, one day someone brought in a bunch of books. And I didn't know about this, but the librarian at the time, she said, she said what are we going to do with these books? She says, what's, what's the matter with the books? He says, they're history books. And we can't put them up on the shelf because they have leather bindings and their leather bindings are rotten. And I said, oh, I'm going to have a look. See? So I went downstairs and uh, yes, there was 24 books. It was a 25 set book, uh, book set, but the first volume was missing. We never did find it, never got, got it at all. And uh, the bindings were really bad and they stank. And uh, so I said to her, I said, well, we should bring them to the dump, basically. You can't put these on the shelf. So I looked inside the book, and they were printed in 1901. That's when they were printed. So I said, you know what? I says, why don't I take these books out of here? Instead of bringing them to the dump, I'll take them home. I'll see what I can do with them. There was very, the books were called a Historian's History of the World. And they had all these authors, and the books were basically uh, up until 1900. And then they were printed, and uh, basically they uh, they ended up at my place. I took them to Thunder Bay and had them rebound, and uh, it cost me pretty close to 500 bucks to have that done. I still have them, and they're fantastic. I mean, if you ever know anything about anywhere, that's where you go. But the history only goes up to 1900. That's the only problem, you see. So if you want to know inch, ancient history, that's where you find it. Oh and uh, I'll probably donate them back, who knows when when that happens. But you have no idea where they came from, though, eh? No, I never did find out. And, you know, I went on the Internet, and I punched in historians, history of the world, and sure enough, it came up. And that's how I got volume one. I downloaded volume oh. one on a disc. And now I have the whole set, you know, because volume one was ancient history, Egypt, uh, mostly Egypt and uh, and the far, far, the Near East, I should say, you know, and that was the one that was missing. But I, since I'm Dutch, I was very interested in what it said about it. And it's, the books are so well written that and easy to read. They have paper that doesn't shine and it's easy to read. And I, I sure wish that somebody would be interested in history. I'd give them to them, but not right away. But I pass <laughs> along. You know, I don't pass anything out unless I'm gone. But anyway, yeah. So I'm, I was also on the uh, on like on different committees with the, with uh, while I was on council. And I remember being on the cemetery cemetery committee with right. you, and naturally library board, or whatever. We did a lot a lot of work. Right. And I'm just. Sitting here blowing my own horn, I think, but I did That's do all right. these things. But we need volunteers like uh, like you and like me that were on some of those committees. And it's interesting that the lo the museum is recording some of that information because each person we interview, John has a little bit different insight into yep. some of the things that happened. Yes, that's right. So, perfect. Yeah. I think that's... Uh, Should be done. Okay. Yes, very good.